so all of your time is not completely consumed with these transformative endeavors. Um, let's talk about kind of what you do for self-care, for nurturing uh, yourself to kind of stay sane, as it were. Uh, when you sit down at home or you're out with friends uh, for a favorite meal to eat, man, what, what's on your plate? What is like, we're about to eat good right now for you? Good. Uh, ironically, this is sad, but ironically, like, I can't find my meal when I go out. Like, as a vegetarian in South Africa, mm -hmm. I've accepted that as soon as I walk out of my door, yeah. I'm stepping down in the taste level of this world, <laughs> of what I'm going to get, right? Okay. But um, my favorite meal will be a home-cooked, uh, something called ucheke, no bonji. Mm -hmm. which is just like really beautiful steamed bread that's made with love. Okay. <laughs> In the, it's a Zulu uh, steamed bread called the Cheka. You can tell by the name, it has a click in it. Right? Sure. It means there's a lot in it. And uh, Bonchis is beans. Okay. Bro, simply that joint with beans will knock you. Uh, it's like the best meal. I, I mean, I've been to Italy, dog. I've been to... Mexico, I've been to Puerto Rico, I've had eaten my fogo, I've eaten everything, but nothing okay. <laughs> compares to this day. Yo, when I so, come to Durban, you're going to have to prepare that uh, for me, man. We're going to have to break bread together and have that meal. 100%, 100%. And then now, in addition to that, I play soccer. Help me pronounce it again, the name of the meal. Ucheg. <laughs> Ucheg. No, Ucheg. Yeah, that's good. That's ah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. The second one, the second one. Oh, the, the second one was better. Okay. I got to keep practicing that. I'm looking forward to it. So you play yeah, soccer yeah. for kind of self-care and to decompress. Yeah, man, I think that um, it, it's a misnomer that because we're young, we are not impacted by a lot of what we see and what we experience. So I think that to have outlets and avenues that we take to kind of um, really take care of our mental health, take care of our emotional health, take care of our spiritual health, nurture friendships. Um, of course, being socially distanced has made that a little bit more challenging, but I think as we already talked about, necessity yields creativity. Um, so I'm glad that you've got soccer um, or football as an outlet and, and some other ways as well. Man, listen. It's been tough though this year um, because of COVID, so I haven't been able to play a lot. And, you know, I think self-care is something that I struggle with because I'm so driven and I'm constantly trying to push the envelope in so many ways. Yeah. But, you know, second to soccer, this is one of my biggest self-care. Conversation. Just being able to, yeah, just being able to, to, to intellectual conversation with people yeah. that I love and, and care about that give me a different insight. So that's what I've been doing quite a bit. And I, because of Andrews and traveling, I've got quite a bit of networks with folks quite a, all over the world. So being able to jump on a call, call and just be like, how are you doing, man? Like, how, how have you held up? Has just been very encouraging and lifting to my heart and my soul. I think that's what has kept me sane more uh, during quarantine as we've been locked in, in our houses. Yeah, I can say the same thing. Um, literally down to text messages. There was a time where text messaging was just kind of third level of communication or so. And now it's kind of risen in terms of its importance and value when you're able to exchange, knowing that you can't see that person or come in contact with them physically. Uh, those messages mean uh, the world. FaceTiming, WhatsApp video calls that we do, um, those do, um, they have a, a different quality of value now and I'm grateful for it. Um, I want you to share, and I thank you too, because you know, as I've shared even from my perspective, uh, and walk in life vocationally as a pastor. Um, you've helped me kind of think about what ministry looks like outside of what you were trained to do. You spoke to it from an architectural standpoint. What they were giving us that was textbook wasn't going to suffice for the calling and vision that I have. Um, so I needed to step outside of the textbook, be mindful of what's in the textbook, be mindful of what I am learning, but also not feel like this these are the walls and you can only look between them. There's so much else going on. And so um, uh, it's been mutually beneficial for us. And I, and I thank you for that. 
Um, you need to ahead. break. You need to. You need to know the rules in order to break them. For sure. I that's what they, they used to tell us. And also at the end of the day, what is a coliseum going to do for a person living in a shanty town? Yeah. Yeah. You know. What I mean? mm -hmm. So it's like, I right, let me learn the principles of what's possible, but then really combine it with the local ingenuity and creativity and create mm. something that's really dope. Yeah, and that's what I always challenge classes. And we had this conversation before. I was like, bro, I think there's so much more, especially yeah. in um, in in 2021 with COVID, et cetera. It's like, bro, you know, how relevant is your traditional pulpit now, mm -hmm. um, especially for young folk? Sorry to steer the conversation a little different. I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, I was talking to a friend in LA and um you know who went through some trauma when she was young and uh they were they're saying uh, they had covid and i asked them like yo did you think about like death at one point when you got sick did you think about god religion um and they're like yeah i did um they're like you know i thought about if god is real and is love I am angry at him for not having intervened when I needed him most, mm. when I was most vulnerable and, and uh, you know, being taken advantage of and using prayer as my only, like, prayer as my only shield. Yeah. So using prayer as my only shield that I knew I had and yet yeah. nothing happened. It's like, it's like, I felt like he was, he, he kept me on red. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, yeah, man, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, man, like that's, that's really rough, but like, how do you respond to that? You know, and this is where the challenges come in. It's like, man, clearly you're not going to reach that person through uh, a sermon at some pulpit, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, there's definitely different avenues. And also, I think that person would be more open speaking to me than to you. Mm -hmm. um, to me, they see a kindred spirit who's trying to figure things out. Yeah. And who's also really putting some of that into action. Like, how are you doing it? Like, didn't you experience that? How is God still? Because I get a lot of those questions like, from, from the same person. Like, do you still consider yourself as right. a set of the Adventists and this and this and that? So there's an openness there, but you already come with sort of the, the baggage of like, oh, I haven't been to church yeah. <laughs> in X amount of years. He probably thinks I'm this. Yeah. Or I'm going to hell, you know, all mm -hmm. that stuff, which is the bad stereotypes that have come with the narrative of how you've been doing church for, for such a long time. Right. So I'm like, man like any organization or business or whatever, we may want to rethink how we operate and how we serve people. You know, I think that for a long time, church has existed as this thing where we are supposed to serve it, which mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. Church is supposed to serve us. Mm -hmm. Like when you come to church, it's like you dress this way. Yeah. Sit this way, sing this way, this this way, this is this. We are there to serve that building and its rules. Versus yeah. that, that institution exists to actually serve us. I'm with you. I hear you. You know, yeah. it's interesting because in many ways I see what I do. Well, let me go back and say it like this. In many ways, I feel that some see what I do in many, in a way that a lot of people might see what doctors do. So it never ceases mm. to amaze me. And when I say doctors, I mean medical physicians. It never ceases to amaze me of how many people say, you know, I don't like going to the doctors because I don't understand when they speak to me. You go in there and they begin to speak yeah. in terminology that is often like above people's heads. It's very quick. You only see them for like three minutes and then they're out. You spend more time yeah. in the waiting room, more time with the nurse or no knock to nurses, right? But they say, okay, well, yeah. the doctor will be, within, be in with you shortly. And I often say what they should say is the, the doctor will be with you shortly. Not like they're coming in in a little while, they're actually gonna be here for a brief amount of time and then they're out, <laughs> right? 
And because of that, people often become very defensive and unwilling to go and see a doctor, even though they come with information that is helpful. The experience is my point. The experience is not always becoming. So what they'll be more open to is their next door neighbor who would say, oh, I have a home remedy, home remedy for that. You know, just, you know, scrape some paint off of the wall, put some water and oil in it, and then drink that and, and you'll be fine. It's like, oh, that worked for you? Yeah, that worked for me. It's like no doctor would tell you to do that. But I actually yeah. trust my neighbor more. I, I have an experience with her or experience with him that says, hey, you would not tell me anything that would harm me or I actually understand what you're saying. The doctor might give me something that can help me, but one, I'm not too sure if the doctor is really concerned about my good or is just concerned about my money, right? So talking about institutions, expectations, assumptions, truth, tradition, all these words that mix in together that make it so that when you hear the word go to the doctor or the phrase go to the doctor, you know, walls go up. But when you listen to a friend or a neighbor or a relative, your walls aren't as high, you're open to hearing things. Um, this is why in the African American community, um, one of the most profoundly um, interesting spaces to hear and get a pulse of religion, politics, um, other societal views is in a barbershop or beauty salon. I mean, so much is shared and exchanged there. People are discouraged from voting for certain people. People are encouraged to go to do certain things in these places of trust, right? So now that's a long way to get to this point. As a pastor, I do sense, and it's crazy because I'm a young man who's a pastor, right? And so what comes with that is just the broad strokes often of pastoring. Like you can be as young as you wanna be, but if you're a pastor, we equate you with the pastor who is 75, right? You know. You have an old soul, you have no understanding of, of what's going on in contemporary okay. society. Uh, like you said, right, you know, the, 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 the visuals of it are all kind of the same, you know, suit and tie, standing behind the pulpit, here is what God says. And so what can be interesting is like, just like a person has reservations about going to see the doctor, at times people are more inclined to look left and look right um, to share with their neighbor or to share with a peer or a fellow you know, church member, what they're going through. Now, I don't have a problem with that in the main. What I think we are nearing, and in many ways we are here, is our whole approach to, to, like you said, what it means to carry out the mission and ministry of Christ has to change. And that includes how we are training spiritual leaders. Now, I'm not saying I have all of the answers, but I do think that in addition to, say, for instance, how to preach homiletics, which that, that's a passion of mine, I will never dismiss that. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it needs to, it could stand to be informed by more than the mechanics of preaching, right? Putting words together to convey a thought. We know that words matter, right? That's no one's questioning that. But words don't only matter from the pulpit, right? Words mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. matter in one-on-one. -on -one. Words matter mm -hmm. in the privacy of a phone call, a Zoom mm -hmm. chat. Now, add to this, mm -hmm. this socially distant era, right, where my congregation <laughs> is a camera that I look into. And yeah. by faith, I believe that people are on the other end on their receiving devices, listening to the word, right? So my thoughts now are you have an opportunity not just to speak um, about things, we have to remember we're speaking to people, right? And so I was just having this conversation with my wife and I was talking about how theology, the study of theology or the thinking about God happens in the context of human experience. So as you shared the story about your friend, right? Um, all I was thinking was that it's virtually impossible to, at that point, it's not, it's not a time for teaching. If they have just said, hey, you know, this is the question that I have for God, it is not my job or my responsibility, nor is it the time to come back and say, well, let me tell you theologically about God and how, you know, a theology of suffering. Yo, like it makes no sense what they went through. And the mysteries <laughs> are real, right? How yeah. does God permit this to happen and still be a loving God, right? That, that my 
my our opportunity, I wouldn't even say responsibility because even that can sound really dogmatic, right? My responsibility. The opportunity is there as I'm sure you did just to be with that person. Yeah. In school, we learned a lot of like how to answer the hard questions. But I'm learning like not every hard question deserves an attempt at an answer. Sometimes all you need to do is just be there, you know, and and and, and, and seek to do the hard work of empathizing and sympathizing and telling people I don't understand this experience by way of my own journey, um, and I can only yeah. imagine how how difficult this is to reconcile with with notions of God that have been presented, right? And and, and man, long story short there's just certain things that only God can reveal about himself. You know, mm. I, I'm just not able mm. to do that. There's certain things that I think are true, but truth is more than just the truth cognitively. There's the truth that has to be um, gained experientially. And I think when it comes to our experiences, God alone can, can make things real and, and relevant to certain people. So, um, you're right, man. I think that now more than ever as pastors and as churches, um, we are being compelled to think and rethink and imagine and reimagine and do the hard work of praying and praying over again about, Lord, you know, where is the way forward? And if it's going to be uncomfortable, and it will be, um, so since it's going to be uncomfortable and since it will be into uncharted waters, now more than ever, we need, we need to depend on you and your spirit to give us discernment as you direct us. Right. Uh, this is deep. This is deep. This is deep. Because I think the only reason why we, we were able to get that far in the conversation is because I had shared my own struggle mm -hmm. with church, you know what I mean? Especially today. And, you know, this is probably the first time I share this in a public platform, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, the level of anxiety mm -hmm. and anxiousness that I have when I walk into church, uh, here like my local church in south africa or to, to a certain degree when i come into a room with you know folks that i went to church with at end it's not like you but like in in a collective right mm -hmm. it could be clubhouse could be whatever it's just like it's crazy there's there's that there's that like grave sense of i need to be a certain way yeah right um and even as I start to having conversations, um, I I feel like the conversations are trying to make you a certain way. Yeah. Um, to live up to a particular standard that that you also secretly know that no one here actually lives up to. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yeah, this is not good for my own mental health, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But also some of the memories that come with that space mm -hmm. because this is the this is the space similar to her it's like this is the space you came to for refuge yeah uh, but this is often the space you are most judged uh this is often wow. the same space you, wow. you are most looked down upon yeah uh you know what i mean in the name of this cat yeah it's really tough to reconcile all of that today it is and, and and that's 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 the beauty and the burden of how god has developed a a portion of how he reveals himself right like he he works through a representative model so what does the bible say matthew 5 says um man now all of a sudden the exact wording is, is escaping me but it's matthew 5 where it says um let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven in other words you are light you are salt in this world and i'm going to work through your life to allow people to get a sense of who i am right representative model yeah. represent me in the world so that people have a visible idea of the invisible well, the reality is not everyone who can be seen and who bears the name Christian or God seeker or God fearer has presented a trustworthy example of who God is. Hearts have been broken. Mm. 
people have been traumatized and we don't need to get into the weeds of the experience, right? Uh, even what has been taking place here in America as of late um, under the name and banner of Christianity makes it very interesting because now as a Christian, somebody who's not a Christian can say, you agree with that? And I say, no, yeah, I don't you're agree. You're a white supremacist. That. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that is not yeah. the brand or genre of Christianity. So you've got all these kind of, you know, expressions of, of what it means. So everyone kind of takes the name, right? Um, it's like there, there might be, I don't, I don't know that there are, but there may be other Wandile Mtianes um, in the world, right? And, and yeah. all of them are doing what you're doing. But if people aren't aware that not every Wandile is the same, whenever they hear your name, they might say, oh, no, I don't trust you. And you're like, why? What did I do to, to not deserve your trust? And it, well, you didn't do anything, but this one did. And therefore I cast yeah. it off as well. Now, 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 that being said, I do think that there's a principle there that one of, again, the beauties and the burdens of being a part of this representative model of, of God's plan for revealing his love is that a lot of people will plug into the, to the nominal nature of Christianity. And therefore it becomes challenging because even just by name, you're associated with a lot of the bad things that are a part of it, right? Um, so, so in other words, yeah. I, I'll illustrate it like this. Not long ago, one of my cousins, <laughs> um, she said to me, man, like whenever we interact, I feel guilty. Now in my mm. mind, I'm thinking to myself, like, why do you feel guilty when we interact? Well, that's kind of a rhetorical question. I get the sense of why they might feel that way, especially if they might feel like, you know, certain factors of my lifestyle don't necessarily reflect uh, themes that we caught and were taught growing up. And now as a pastor, um, and I'll add this little addendum to this story, we still live in a world, especially when it comes to Christianity, where a lot of our thinking, theologizing, and reflecting on how we interact with one another is between the poles of right and wrong. Is it right? Is it wrong? 100%. It wrong, right. 100%. So we it's want black, really and white. black and white, you know, ways of dealing with it. And so when people look to a person like me, who's a pastor, they assume that this is how he's probably looking at me too, that my life is either right or my life is either wrong. I'm either making all wrong choices or I'm making all right choices and there's never any in between. And I've been kind of rethinking this thing, man. Like when you look at Christ's method of discipleship, of developing people, and for those persons who might be a little unfamiliar with discipleship or it's kind of an old word you know let's 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 use character development right that's essentially what is one of the you know goals of salvation and and sanctification now not character development that is just self-help aisle you know reading but character development that's like yo there's something significantly off about the human species and god actually has a plan to resolve that and invites you to participate in that with him so in order to showcase that, God actually calls people to himself who have miles to go when it comes to development. So he knows from the moment of call, this is not black and white. Like there's a lot of gray here. What is black and white is I love you and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about that. And I'm hoping that you would come to know through all of your experiences in life that my love is real, right? I hope that you come to trust me. And I know that one of the challenges for a human being to trust in God is reconciling what and why God permits things that are not fair, right? Mm -hmm. And God does not run away from those challenging questions. When people raise their voices and sometimes raise their fists with tear-filled eyes and say, God, why? God, how? God, where were you? God actually allows himself to be placed in the hot seat. And he receives that kind of, that kind of questioning, right? So now as a pastor, I have to ask myself, if that's how God interacts with people, right? Knowing where they are, being patient with them on their journey, then I feel like that is a part of my calling as well. That life experience mm. is not black and white and that the things about God that are black and white have already taken in consideration that reality. There's gonna be a lot of people in your pews who represent the fact that life follows diverse pathways, right? You've got some people who, they were just born with different set of cards in their hands. And so if I'm only saying when you pray, you know, God blesses you in this way, 
how does that reflect the experience of people in the pews you're, or now in their homes, right? No pews anymore. How does that reflect it? People are going to say, well, wait a minute, I pray and this didn't happen for me. So what, did I not pray hard enough? Was my faith not strong enough? You know what I mean? Um, That's my, the my, premise of that conversation. Exactly. Like, I prayed. <laughs> you know, I've got faith, but, but I was abused and this person has faith yeah. preserved. So how does this work, right? So it becomes this, this dance, as it were, between saying, well, what God, what has God revealed about himself? And then when it comes to the mysteries of life, and this is often where these conversations go, right? I am becoming more and more okay acknowledging that when it comes to a person's lived experience, that those mysteries in terms of answering the why questions, those are places where I as a human being cannot go. And a part of the faith-based ministry that God has called me to, to extend is to say, I am sorry that this happened. And it is very unfortunate. It's too light of a word. It's tragic. And I don't have answers, but my heart does believe in the promise of a Psalm 18, a Psalm 34, 18, which says God is close to the brokenhearted and saves those mm. who are of contrite spirit, you know? God, God is close to us. Why he allows these things, I don't know. I do know that he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I do know that he did not spare his son from experiencing great offense. Now, even then, I want to be careful. Even then, I want to be careful. I want to be careful because I'm not trying to theologize it. I'm not trying to, to just say, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, Jesus died. He felt pain. <laughs> he understands your pain, right? Like, you know, honestly, because we... we <laughs> We, we live in a generation where folk aren't so easily like, oh, Eureka, he died, yeah, yeah, you know, and now it makes sense. No, folk are like, what does that have to do with me, right? You know, <laughs> what he went through was, 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 some would even say it was even lighter than what I had to experience. Right? Uh, yeah, he volunteered for that death, bro. <laughs> yeah, like, like, that's what he did. I didn't volunteer for the death I had to experience, you know? So, so my point is, just connecting with you, man, we live in a, we're living in a time where those are the kinds of messages that can not only just be preached. It's not a one and done thing, you know what I mean? And it just comes with the territory. Well, also just, and just, you know, to add, I know closing, um, I grew up behind the pulpit as well. You know, I grew up preaching, which I think has made me a relatively okay public speaker in the <laughs> in the outside world, and from the age of twelve, you know, coming up, and now I'm like twenty seven, and I'm looking back, I'm like, man, <laughs> all that stuff I was preaching, yeah, <laughs> versus all this life that I'm living. Hey, that's it. That's it. That's it right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, re I'm trying to reconcile these two worlds. And um, just the lack of grace that existed, that came with the pulpit territory wow. in how that was articulated, but also how I was taught as a kid, yeah. how I was taught, you know, the reverence and, and how that's articulated and, and how you read the Bible then, this is how you read it now. And now it's just like, there's so much phoniness yeah. that when I look back at it, I see, and it's like, it's really hard sometimes to sit down and watch and listen to certain pastors preach. Yeah. Because again, I've got that insight of having been there. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, ah, oh, man, just like be yourself, be yourself, be yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, be authentic. Also like, you know, uh, you know, just connect on a human level with mm -hmm. us, please. Like, yeah. That's right. And, and just there's a lot, you know, that, that that I'm wrestling with, that I'm 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 looking at, on 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 that end, and then the point about God being love, mm -hmm. right? So if God's love, right, why can't everyone go to heaven? And mm -hmm. here's here's my explanation, and this is a theological. Um, theory that exists out there, yeah. the universal salvation. Um, this idea that like, you know, no one wakes up and says, I'm going to be a prostitute, I'm going to be a hoe. <laughs> That's no one's dream. You wake up with the bill not paid. 
Yeah. Uh, the rent not being able to be paid. And, and that happens month one, you know, month two, month three. Uh, your kid is kicked out of school. Mm. Uh, it's freezing cold in Michigan and you don't have air conditioning. And all of a sudden, what your friend Janine has been saying starts getting more and more enticing. You're yeah. tired of borrowing money, yeah. you know, and not being able to pay it back. It's like, man, let me just do this a little bit until I get back on my feet so that I can, you know, do this, this, this. You know what I mean? And all this stuff. So if God's love and he's with us and he understands, he understands the rationale behind every decision made. Yeah. Not to justify it, but he understands where it comes from. Uh, because, you know, when you, it's like everyone given the chance of heaven or hell, mm-hmm. right? It's like, oh, man, I want to go to heaven. I want to live <laughs> yeah. forever. Glory, this, 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 this. Like no one, I believe, in their rational mind will just choose that. Yeah, They're obviously influenced by the devil and the snares that the devil has put, which leads to the decisions they make, which break God's law. Mm-hmm. So that's an interesting concept <laughs> that I would love to hear your thoughts on, on those things. Yeah, you know, you're right, that there is a growing theory of universal salvation. Um, and there are tangents to that as well, which we'll have to preserve for another conversation. But I think you're right on, right? I think you're right on par with this idea that God's love is universal, right? And we have to go back and ask ourselves, how is love conveyed? And how is love that can be trusted conveyed? And I heard it said like this before that, that really, really blessed me. So first of all, in our Western world, sometimes love and law relationship and certain rules are seen as mutually exclusive, you know, so that if you love me, then you should give me freedom. And the reality is that that freedom has been given to us. We have freedom of choice. God has not obligated anyone to reciprocate his professed love to us back to him, right? But love does not come with freedom that exists without rules or boundaries. In other words, when I say rules and boundaries, that the freedom God gives actually is fueled by the rules and regulations that support it. Now, forgive me for the limitations of English language, because what comes with language is like implications. So when you say words like rules and regulations, that can mean so much to so many people, right? So I'm just going to ask for forgiveness on the front end. Terms and conditions. Yeah, yeah, the, the limitations of language, right? But but from the heart of God, when it comes to to what I'm simply trying to say is, it's almost like this. By law, I put that in quotes, the rules and regulations of of a car are every so many miles, you need to get your oil changed, right? You know, every 3000 miles, or every, you know, after so much time has elapsed, get your oil changed. Now that that rule, that regulation, that suggestion even, is not to spoil your driving experience. It's actually to prolong your driving experience such that if you break that rule, after a while, you're going to see quite naturally what happens to a car's ability to function well without its oil being changed. That's a loose illustration, but it simply points us at least in the direction of when God says, do this or don't do that, or I've created you for this and not for that. It's similar to the idea of this car has been created to function and a part of what maintains its function is the necessity of getting these aspects of it checked. And if this doesn't happen, then there's an if-then relationship. If the oil's not changed and the car continues to seek to run, it's going to suffer, right? So the manufacturer created it with love and in love also said, here's what it needs to do in order to maintain what it is it was created for. Same thing with us, right? Now, let me plug this in there as well. One of the challenges of this is, again, A part of this is already making sense to you because we kind of share space on similar lily pads, as it were. But one of the one of the opportunities that exists now is how do you explain this, not just for like, you know, I'm going to persuade you, I'm going to change your opinion in life. Right. But how do you convey this to a person whose starting point is not you don't share a starting point. Right. So so Mm. there's some difficulty there. Right. If a person 
is trying to wrestle with the notion of God, then, you know, you come at this a little differently. But since we kind of share space on the same lily pad, the idea is this, that there, it is possible for there to be a loving God who gives freedom of experience and choice, who also articulates, hey, I have a design and a desire for you, but this comes with conditions, right? The idea of conditions is not even a philosophy that humans created. Nature operates based on conditions. The very notion of a drought speaks to the conditional relationship of nature. If there is no rain, then this is what will happen. If there is mm -hmm. rain, then this is what will happen, right? So conditions mm -hmm. are not conjured up by humans who are just trying to make God make sense. No, God says, if then is a part of the way life goes. This is how I created it, right? Starting with myself. If I am a loving God, then this is what it is, right? So now when it comes to now reconciling that in what we would call a fallen environment, in other words, life as it is being lived in many respects is not according to God's ideal plan, okay? Um, so then how do we understand God? How do we get a chance to trust in him, know him, believe him when so much of life is counterintuitive, seemingly contradictory, it's chaotic, controversial, et cetera, et cetera. God plunges into the mix. He doesn't stay distant, right? He sends Jesus Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God with us. Us, who's us? Us is very complex. Us don't have, excuse my poor English. Us don't have uh, like experiences. Us are poor. Then some of us are rich. Us are black. Uh, us are white. You know, us are tall. Us, you know, us, God with us. Which portion of us is God with? Because all of us don't share the same experiences, right? And he says, I'm with all of us. God is with everybody. So how can God be with the oppressor and the oppressed? And the oppressed. <laughs> how can God come and be with the victim and the suspect at the same time? Right, like I'm trying yeah. to, because I don't want God with us. I want God with me, not with them. Mm. <laughs> right? I want God with me, not with you. But God says, no, I'm with us. So it must mean that when it comes to God revealing himself to us, that as God reveals himself to me, he reveals enough of himself such that I can believe in him. And that belief is not simply empirical belief or intellectual belief, but it is, I want to believe such that I am changed and growing into who you've created me to be. The way he does that for me might not be the same way he does that for the oppressor because the oppressor's experience might need to see a picture of God that challenges his or her in his or her lifestyle as an oppressor. Like, hey, wait a minute. Your life does not reflect the name that you profess. God is not an oppressive God, right? So you're saying, okay, how does that lead to then repentance in life, right? So now coming home with this idea of why then can't everyone go to heaven? And I want to say everyone can go to heaven, but the pathway there is according to what God has given us as the path there. See, we wonder why can't I do what I want, say what I want, live how I want. Not that heaven is gained by our works. That's not what I'm saying. But again, just as if a drought takes place when there's no rain, heaven has conditions to it. And the conditions I believe are very clearly outlined. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The access is, do you believe that whatever was broken was fixed in Christ? Yeah. Not just on a cosmic level, but I'm going to prove to you that even in your life, God can fix that which is broken. And that belief is one of the things that God gives us power to come to. So for the young lady who was speaking to you, I'm not impressing that upon her just in terms of a Bible study with words on pieces of paper. Right? <laughs> she has to come to that experience with God where the broken things that he's permitted in her life, she uh, says, you know what, but God can still fix this. I'm not happy for it. I didn't pursue this cross, but I believe that since he carried his, he can help me carry mine. And just like life came out of his death, maybe life can come out of this dying and death-like experience for me as well. At first, I was going to say, uh, when you made that car illustration, I was like, yeah, I get it. We need the oil to run, blah, blah, blah. We're good. Mm -hmm. So now the car breaks down. 
is the mechanic who creates it is willing to take it back <laughs> and fix it, you know, and make it right, right? But, you know, at least within the finite understanding of the second coming, etc., the mechanic is willing to take it back for only so long mm-hmm. until a certain point. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, so the, I, I, there's that, or does the mechanic take it back at the end and fix it to brand new, <laughs> to yeah. usher into a new world? You know, I think that there's that. But then you made the illustration of nature, mm-hmm. where if there's a drought, things die. Yeah. That's a harsher illustration than that of the mechanic <laughs> because the plants actually die, mm-hmm. dissolve into the soil, become sort of fossil fuels that helps in other new plants grow. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that, I don't know. I think to that point, yeah. to that point, nothing's ever wasted, right? So mm-hmm. recently I was sharing the story of Judas, one of Christ's disciples. And I was just kind of thinking, you know, why is this story in here? Because it kind of shows like, and I was kind of kind of being a little bit mischievous, right? Like it's kind of a, like in a report card full of A pluses, like this is the failing grade. You know, you had 12 and just one of them, it just didn't work out, right? But yeah. I think even his story is included as a reflection of just the reality of life in a fallen world, right? That, yeah. that the conditions for salvation are such that no one has to be lost. No one has to miss out on the kingdom, right? The reason why there is no universal collection of everybody at the end is because the conditions are right now. Right now, for everyone who is living, the opportunity is there, right? See, God could be justified as being called, God could be justifiably called unfair if conditions were never given for an opportunity. Then he could say, well, you need to have something at the end where everyone's ultimately taken in. He's like, no, the reason why I'm not going to do that is because the same conditions of love that I gave to the first family are still in existence, right? I want you to respond to my love. Just like they had a choice not to respond, same thing. The choice not to respond is still there, but the benefits, the blessings, the gifts that come in terms of your belief in me are, are, are in place even now, right? And I'm telling you ahead of time that, that there will come a time where just like, and this is the, this is the beautiful picture of it, um, it is that, that scene of Noah getting onto the ark and the door is closed and now no one else can get on, right? Is this idea that it wasn't like there was no forewarning, right? The opportunities were there and opportunities led to a point of decision making, right? So a lot of people really feel like God being who God says he is, or at least who people say God says he is, means that there needs to be this eternal um, open door where anybody can get in whenever they want to. But again, some of that is not so far removed from accessible illustrations in our lives. So there's a young lady who's interested in you, you're interested in a young lady. Um, Very rarely is she going to spend the rest of her life waiting for you to make a decision. (laughs) 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 At at some point, (laughs) and and she might wait a long time, don't get me wrong. But at some point, it's kind of say, okay, love craves decision. Mm. Love demands decision. The kind of love that God gives and the kind of love that he even He even calls for us to live amongst one another, it does not have lack of decision away from it. Like God does not give undecided love. God is decidedly in love with us. And so what he invites Rich. in return is a decision. I'm like Rich is out here putting my business out to the world like that. <laughs> Oh no, not at all. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, Make a decision, Wandele. Like <laughs> Make a decision. Working on it, bro. Working on it. I'm calculating the numbers, you know? Uh, exactly. <laughs> <Pros and cards. laughs> um, I have like 4%, but just to add to your thing, this is me like working against my own argument. Uh, 
Andy Mania, one of my favorite rappers, yeah. talks about, he says that when you fall in love with someone, it's like giving them a loaded gun mm. and trusting that they're not going to shoot you. My, 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 my. <laughs> That's a word. <laughs> right? And then number two, I'm realizing from Eden, this love thing has always been conditional, y'all. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's always had this thing, you know? Yeah. We th- th- somewhere somehow we misconceived it and that it had no condition. There's yeah. always been condition. And then the last one is like he talked about. It's like yo, look again. Andy Mina is like when you're out in the Bahamas, mm-hmm. right? You're like in that like room with a glass wall. Yeah, literally like the water comes up to like close to your window. You come out to this French balcony. You're looking out. Beautiful. Blue waters, blue sky. Amazing. Yeah. Just jump out of the house and go swim. Right? That's amazing. Yeah. But the difference between that and a disaster is boundaries. <laughs> mm, mercy. Mercy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Definitely. Like, think of that same situation, but then think of a tsunami disaster where that water goes over yeah. the edges and comes into your house. Mm. And then now it's a disaster and you die, you're suffocating, you're struggling. And that what love is without boundaries, that what happened. Yeah. I'm like, good. yeah. That's good. That's good. Hey, listen, we got to bring it to a close. We got to bring it to a close. We'll have to have, in fact, I already sense that this is going to, um, this is going to bless a lot of people. And I appreciate your time, man. Really quickly, just give us, fire off for us your social media handles and websites that we can check out to support and follow um, the really transformative work you're doing. So it's uh, Wandile Ubuntu uh, on Instagram and Wandile Ubuntu on, uh, on Twitter, as you see it here or here or here. <laughs> Depends on how sophisticated you are, Rich. You gotta have to put these things up now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If, hey, it, you might be pushing me. They might see it here, here, and and here. Just look in the description, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then our website is ubuntudivinegroup.com. And uh, you can also check out Ubuntu Architecture Summer Abroad, where we teach African architecture to students awesome. from around the world, and they get to learn about Zulu architecture and stuff. So. Fantastic. Listen, everybody, thank you for hanging out with us in the living room today. I hope you are more inspired to put your feet on the ground, plunge your hands into the chaos that is often accompanying change efforts. As you've heard from our special guest, Mr. Wandile Mtiane, go check him out, support, follow, have conversation with him. Let's take this conversation as a launching point into future change initiatives where you are. You never know how what you cast into the waters will create ripple effects that will change lives for years to come. That's all we have for this episode of The Living Room. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Our special guest has been Mr. Wandile Mtiane, founder and CEO of Ubuntu Design Group. Continue to listen, continue to learn, and continue to live. We'll see you next time.